All right, well, thanks for having me. It's really awesome to be here, and I look forward to the talk. Um, let's please make this interactive. It's a lot more fun if you guys ask lots of questions. So just interrupt me at any time. Um, so as Mike mentioned, my day job is uh, I'm an IT guy for a, a Fortune 500 company. And in my spare time, I like to make stuff. I'm an engineer. So I've turned a few of the things that I've made into actual products. And um, I'm going to share that journey with you today. And, and hopefully, you guys will take away some from some of those things and maybe avoid some of the mistakes that I made. But let me start with what I do. So this was my idea. So it's, a, it's an LED handbag. So it's basically a purse. And the idea is that you can change the designs from your phone. So I have an app, and I can just tap the different designs. And so I came up with this idea because I have a wife that spends a lot of money on handbags. And so I got really mad one day because all my money was going to her handbag habit. So I thought, hey, well, if I could make, make her a bag that she could just change like that, she would buy less handbags, and I'd save myself some money. So of course, I did it. It didn't work. She still buys plenty of handbags. But um, we learned along the way that there was something there. People kind of like this thing. So then we decided to turn it into a product. So that's how it, how it got started. So today, I want to talk about um, crowdfunding. I everyone here, has anyone here heard of Kickstarter, Indiegogo? OK, yeah. anyone not heard of those? OK, cool. So I'll talk about that. I did a few crowdfunding campaigns. So definitely some, I think, good lessons learned I can share with you guys. Um, talk about how to get customer validation of your product, which is really important, because a lot of people skip that step. And a little bit about marketing, although I'm not the best marketing guy, but I can share some of my lessons learned on marketing, a little bit about what I call investor reality TV, some <coughs> gotchas, and then a real life um, pitch deck. So if you ever find yourself in front of a VC or an angel investor, um, what are you going to talk about? Right? So I'll, I'll show you a real life example of the pitch deck that I've used for this product. So just real quick, um, my personal journey. Um, started this back in April of 2013. Uh, did something similar to this. Imagine, I didn't bring it with me, but en envision that like kind of on a picture frame. So that was the first version of the product. And then uh, had this idea, thanks to my wife's handbag habit, to come up with a purse. That was in 2015. Did a couple Kickstarters. We did um, a show called Intel America's Greatest Makers. That was my first TV show. Did another show recently. And um, along the way, have shipped some product and gotten a lot of great feedback and, and learnings. So far, I've done um, five, five uh, campaigns. Two were funded. Uh, no, sorry. Three were funded, and two were not. Um, so I want to talk about some lessons learned, why some of them didn't make it, why some of them did make it. If you have a product or you want to start a business, you know, at some point, unless you're independently wealthy, you're, you're probably going to need to raise some money. So what are your options, right? Option A is this thing called bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is just a fancy word that means you pay yourself. That, that's all it is. That's pretty much what I've done, by the way. Uh, option two is you go to crowdfunding, Kickstarter, or Indiegogo. Um, typically with these, I have seen a few people try to do it for services, but typically it's for something physical, right? I'm making this widget, and if you back me, you're essentially doing a pre-order, give me 200 bucks, and then when I'm ready, I will ship you this widget, right? That's, that's basically how crowdfunding works. Um, there's these things these days called startup accelerators. So th those are interesting. Um, those are typically three-month programs. And not only do they give you a little bit of money to help fund you, but they give you mentoring. That's kind of the point of, of a startup accelerator. Yes. So Y Combinator, if you've heard of that, that's probably the most famous one. I think they do, I think it's 150000 for 7%, something like that. That's their typical deal. So the, there's a lot of startup accelerators nowadays, actually. So th that's definitely something to look into. And then there's angel investors. These are typically wealthy individuals that have a little extra cash. Um, those typically found through referrals, for example. 
And then, you know, venture capital, right? Formal institutions, uh, typically professionally managed fund. You know, these guys will typically look for a return on investment of 10x. So if they invest $100,000, they want to get a million dollars back, right? So pretty big expectation. Crowdfunding 101. So if you're if you have a product that lends itself to crowdfunding, i.e., physical product such as yours, highly recommend crowdfunding. I think it's a great way to test the market. Um, and you know what what you'll find as as you go down your entrepreneurial journey is that your first product may and probably will fail, right? So crowdfunding is a really great way to test the market without a big investment. But the idea is that if you throw out your, your idea and nobody backs it or you don't get enough backers, who cares, right? Move on to the next idea. Um, you didn't waste a lot of your money. You were able to get a lot of good customer feedback. So it's a really great way to go. I, I highly recommend, right? There are, there are some gotchas which I'll talk about. Um, but basically the premise is that you, you, know, you come up with this idea or vision, say, okay, I'm going to make this widget. I'm going to ship this in, say, nine months. And if you back me X dollars, I will give you one, and you'll be one of the first backers to get it, right? That's, that's the general idea. And for their troubles, Kickstarter, Indiegogo typically takes about 5%. And then there's another 3 to 5% in money, transaction, credit card fees stuff. So that's, that's the business model. So it's a pretty good deal, actually. OK, so the only thing I, I tell people is just be careful. Um, a Kickstarter project that doesn't get funded, as I said earlier, who cares? No big deal. You threw out this idea. People didn't like it. Move on to the next project. But a successfully funded Kickstarter that you don't deliver can be a very public failure. And so um, if any of you follow Kickstarter or Indiegogo, a lot of projects actually don't deliver. That's sort of a, the thick, a dirty secret of crowdfunding, especially technology projects, which, which is where my, most of my um, experience is with. So this is just a case study. I think this was quite a few years ago. This was a guy who invented a um, iPad uh, stand, right? So he raised, as you can see, $35,000, 440 backers. And at the beginning, everyone was happy. You know, he was... A lot of nice comments from his backers. Everything was good. Um, the guy, unfortunately, had never had any real life experience in delivering a, a physical product. So he ran into some issues, ended up running out of money, and he couldn't deliver. Right. So then what, what often happens in crowdfunding is the it's sort of a mob mentality. The once happy crowd will turn on you and very quickly um, you know, put, throw you in the fire. So you know, you can see some of these comments. Some some guy got so mad, one of his backers was a lawyer and decided to file a class action lawsuit against the guy. It was only $50, right? But he was so mad. Okay, I'm going to get everyone on board and file a lawsuit. So the guy, it was a really sad story. He had to leave his company. His public reputation was screwed, went back to New York. Um, extreme case, not trying to freak anybody out, but just be careful. Make sure that if you do it, you go in with a product that's fully baked. Have a manufacturer, for example. That's, that's where he screwed up. He didn't have his manufacturer set up before he went on crowdfunding. Okay, So again, just proceed with caution. Um, the next thing, and I think this is extremely important, but make sure you get a lot of customer feedback before you go off and start making stuff and spending money. And I'll give you a real life example of in my case. So. Can you guys tell the difference between these two? Yeah. OK. Which one do you think was more preferred by my customers? This one? Who thinks this one? Raise your hand. Who thinks this one was more preferred? OK. So see, the women are picking this one. So that makes more sense. So th this one was more preferred, right? Now, me as an engineer, I kind of like this one, right? Because it was super bright, and I'm, you know, I'm getting the full power of the LEDs. But so I was actually going to go in with this, but at, in fact, my customers wanted this. Had I not spent the time to talk to them, I would have went in with this. 
and it would have costed me a lot of money to go switch the design. So that's just one kind of visual example of, of why that's important. So I don't, like, I have a lot of products, mm. ideas that I think of, but I'm scared to, like, ask people about. Yeah. Other than, like, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, um, and that's a common fear of most entrepreneurs. Um, the best advice I can give you is it's riskier to proceed with your idea without customer validation than talking to some people in the fear of them ripping you off. Could happen. It could happen, to your point. But, it, but I, what I would tell you, it's even more risky that you go to market with something that hasn't been validated. Because chances are you'll A, you know, make some major design choice that, that didn't meet your customers such as I, or the, the product just isn't the right fit, right? And you'll end up losing a lot of money. So I totally hear you, and, and you gotta be careful on who you talk to, but you can't skip this step. Um, I did a, um, the first TV show I did, uh, America's Greatest Makers, there was 24 other teams. And every team, each of those 24 teams went through the same process. We we're actually forced to do it. That was part of the show is we had to go talk to all these customers. And every single one of those teams made some change based on the customer feedback. So they had in their mind, hey, you know, I, you know, I know what this product is, they had their vision. Everybody was wrong for, for one thing or the other. So for what it's worth, yeah. That's a great question though. That's a great question. Some reading you can do. Um, there's this methodology called the Lean Startup methodology. If you go to this guy's site, steveblank.com, he talks a lot about that. And, and there's a science in also how you do the customer interviews. That's also very important, how you ask the questions. So I won't go into that today, but check out these two links and you'll find some really nice information on, on how to do that. Um, the other thing I'll share actually while I'm here is also, you know, on, on who you think your customers are. So when I first did this, I thought this was a millennial thing. And actually millennials do like it, but the problem is um, because I'm just uh, bootstrapped, I can't make 10,000 of these and sell it for $100 or $150, which is what millennials wanted to pay for it. So right now we sell it for $450, which is a lot of money. Even at that price point, I still lose money, by the way right, because my volume isn't high enough. So that's the other lesson learned is when you're making stuff, you kind of got to scale up. But um, the point is, when we started this, we thought this was a millennial thing, but my price was too high. And so as we did the customer interviews, I talked to all these millennials, they're like, wow, that's super cool. Um, but I only, I only pay $150 for it. And so at that point, we were sort of screwed, right, because I had a product, but my price was too high. and. Uh, sort of by chance, we ended up talking to some uh, demographic of 35 to 50 year old affluent female. And they also liked it, which I, I had no idea that that demographic would be into something like this. And unlike the millennials, they could afford my price point. And so that was the pivot. So I said, okay, great. I need to focus on those guys. Marketing. So, what else? so I, A, I'm an engineer. And engineers are historically really bad marketing people, so I'm, I'm probably the worst guy to give you advice on marketing, but I'll share at least what I learned. And the first thing is that the best marketing you'll ever get is your existing customers. Um, I've sold more of these, and not like that we've sold a lot, but relatively um, most of the sales for this have been through our existing customers. Um, all the other stuff we did, press, you know, websites, blogs, pales in comparison to the sales we got from existing customers. So the takeaway is really make sure you take care of your initial customers because they ultimately will become your best salespeople. That's the takeaway, at least what I learned. And then outside of that, you know, there's blogs, there's websites, there's Facebook, Facebook ads, and it's really all about you know, there's two ways you can go. You can kind of go broad and just get out there as much as you can. And I would argue that's less effective. What's more effective is that you focus on these, but you target where your, you know, where, where is your target demographic? Where do they hang out? So in my case, where, where do 35 to 50 year old affluent females hang out? What, what websites do they go to? What blogs do they go to? 
That's the key. And to give you some real life data, um, here's all the press when we did our first Kickstarter campaign. Here's all the press that we got. So you might look at it and say, well, you know, that's, that's a decent amount of press. Well, I can tell you that only one of those actually led to an actual sale of all that press. You guys want to take a guess which one? Which one? I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. That one didn't, actually. That's, that's good. Well, I want to talk about that, right? This show had um, 2 million views, but I did not generate one sale. Okay? That's, I'm just making my point. Okay? Yes, exactly. Because it's very high. Yes, exactly. So that, that they uh, approached me. I was like, Architectural Digest, right? What does that have to do with this? I was like, okay, whatever. Here's my... Here's my generic um, marketing materials, have at it. They posted it and I sold six handbags the next day, $450 each. That's the only press that led to anything, right? And it's because that's where my target demographic goes to, right? And they're also doing high-end cars, jewelry. Exactly. They all, that's where they hang out, right? My demographic doesn't hang out in any of these other sites. Millennials do. But again, remember I told you they couldn't afford it. Well, that's a good question. So that's kind of the pivot that we're thinking about making is, um, you know, because I'm jumping ahead, but it, it's very hard to build your own brand. So that's another marketing example, I guess, especially the, the handbag brand, right? Because now I'm competing with Prada and Gucci and all these like high-end brands that spend millions and millions of dollars on marketing. I'm just, I'm a nobody, right? Nobody knows who I am. So the pivot we're, we're going to make is actually Rather than me sell that, I sell that, license that technology to those existing brands, right? And then, then you have all the licensing kind of things. Could you do this on a soft bag? Yes. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So this is just a prototype. Yeah. 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 So that was another feedback, right? People wanted um, the soft bag install. So not everyone liked the hard case like that. And did you make the app yourself to connect to the... I did. Yeah, so I can code a little bit. Um, I don't have a whole lot of time with my day job, so I, I coded some of it, and then I outsourced some of it, too. Um, I use this site called Upwork.com. If you guys have heard of that, it's actually pretty good. Yeah. If you have a day job like me, right, you don't have a lot of time. So you kind of need to figure out, you know, how much do you want to do versus how much do you want to kind of pay for someone else to do. So, you know, there, there's one, one option is you, you know, it's made in Taiwan to answer your question, right? So I could have, I could have gone one of two ways. I could have flown to Taiwan and interviewed a whole bunch of factories and, you know, toured everything and selected one. And then I'd have to fly there probably every two months to make sure everything's going well. Big time commitment. Or I found a, a kind of company that does that for me. Obviously, it's more expensive. Right, but I kind of tell them what I want, and they take care of it. Now everything isn't perfect, and they still have to manage it, so it's not you know ideal. But it, it allows me to still do it and still keep my job. Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, so video. So when you're doing crowdfunding, your video is by far your most important marketing asset. On on Kickstarter right now, there's I think 450 technology projects for example. When I did mine, there was 150. So the point is, it's very crowded. And there's so much stuff out there, people's attention is, is very low, right? So if you have this long video that's five minutes and you're going into all this extraneous detail, nobody's going to watch it. Keep your video to, to two minutes or less. And just to show you some data, I did my first campaign. My video was three minutes and 44 seconds. And only 16% of the people actually watched the whole video. The second one, it was a little less, two minutes, uh, two and a half minutes, 29% people watched it. So shorter video, the better. It's tempting to have this really long video, especially if you're an engineer like me and explain everything, but nobody wants to hear that, is the reality. A little bit about Kickstarter in general. Um, people that go to Kickstarter and back stuff are, are typically what, what we call early adopters. So they're not really indicative of consumers in real life. 
So an, as an example, my first Kickstarter, I had 213 total backers. Most of the backers had backed, on average, 27 other projects. So that's, that's a lot, right? That, that, that gets expensive. 10 of them had backed over 100 projects, and one guy had backed over 500 projects. Right? And I call, I call that guy, I was like, wow, right? you've backed so many projects. You know, you know, he just said he's just really into it and wants to support the entrepreneurs. But most people aren't like that, is the point. So when you do crowdfunding, you're gonna get the early adopters, and then when the crowdfunding is over, then you kind of go into the mainstream. It's just a different demographic. Okay, so Kickstarter versus Indiegogo. So I did four Kickstarters and one Indiegogo. My last Indiegogo unfortunately failed. Um, but I did learn the differences between the two. And so with crowdfunding, the most important thing is the real estate. So if you're not on the front page, like on Kickstarter right now, there's 450 technology projects. If yours is number 389 and someone has to scroll all the way down, no one's going to obviously see it, right? So you want to somehow get yourself on the front page, right? So how do you do that? With Kickstarter, the way it works is those projects are curated by actual people. So they have a, a real life human staff that goes and looks at all the new projects and if they see something they like, they say, wow, this is, this is a cool project. I'm gonna feature it, right? So it's a little bit by luck, you know, what, what you, so if it resonated with someone in their staff, that's great, okay? Indiegogo is a little different. It's all about an algorithm. So they don't have any people curating projects. What they do is they say, hey, if this project is getting a lot of momentum, whether that be hits from a Facebook advertisement or um, did the backer generate 30% of his or her goal in advance, then they will feature it. And after mine, mine didn't go through, I actually talked to the, the head, well not the head, but one of the hardware guys at Indiegogo and he told me, he said, like, you got to get 30% funding within two days. So if your goal is, you know, $100, you need to make $30 of that goal within two days over a 30-day campaign. If you don't do that, definitely you're going to go way down, down the queue and nobody's going to find you, which unfortunately happened, was what happened to me. I hit, I think, 10% of my goal within two days. So well short of the 30%. So, you know, how do you hit the 30%? Um, so first, you know, I think like you, you got to have a fairly big community first before you launch, right? Some people think, well, you know, I'll just launch my project and, you know, it'll just be there and magically everyone will see it. It'll be, you know, number 389 is the reality. So what you got to do is first build up your own community and then kind of do the math. So you can say, if I have a mailing list of a thousand people, you know, for the sake of argument, let's say of, of your mailing list, 10% of those people will, will back your project from an email blast that you do. Then you can do the math and find out how much money that's gonna bring in and then see how close that gets you to the 30%. That's basically the formula for Indiegogo. And, and I think that works for Kickstarter too, by the way. So once you get your initial 30%, then the rest is Facebook ads, which is pretty common these days, um, blogs, et cetera, your own social media. Um, Facebook ads are nice because you can get very targeted, right? So just like I told you earlier, I can go into a Facebook ad and I can say, okay, I only want to target 35 to 50, 35 to 50 year old affluent female, makes this much money, has these interests, very specific. You can do that, yes. So I had the chance to go on. Slash elevator. All right, so that was my experience. They reamed you. Yeah, no, they did. They did. Yeah, um, oh, I want to yell at them so bad. Oh my god. You know, actually, um, the ladies actually were a little meaner. A lot of the stuff didn't make it there, so they actually were a little nastier. Oh, 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 you god. know, when you're doing stuff like that, and that's part of the lesson learned, you have to have thick skin. And, and being, an, and not just on TV, just in general, being an entrepreneur, you're going to get a lot of rejection that just comes with the territory, right? You're gonna get rejected, we always rejected more than accepted. So you have to have thick skin, you can't take it personal. All right. Now the other thing is you gotta be, especially with TV, to, to answer your question, 
you got to be careful, right? Had I like kind of gotten all defensive and you know started attacking them, then you know American reality TV likes a villain. Everyone here probably has seen Survivor. You know the villain is the one that gets the airtime, and and people like to watch the villain. So um, these TV shows, you know, they're the, they're not there to support you as the entrepreneur. They're there to sell advertising. They're there to get views. And so they want to meet their formula, which is someone has to be the bad guy. That's the thing, again, with TV is just know that going in, that those things are there, and you just got to have accept that risk. And, and you can mitigate that risk by having your act together. So to answer your question, no, I don't want to go on Shark Tank because I've had enough. But you know, on the flip side, it's a great experience. Just you know, I've never been the best public speaker in the world, so just that alone is, is a great experience. And um, the connections that you met, I met a really nice uh, a lady, one of the other contest contestants backstage, so we're still friends. You, you get a lot of these connections, so that's, that's a big plus. You know, you grow your network. Um, and it's most likely not the marketing boost that you're expecting, as I talked about earlier. So that episode I just showed you got over 2 million views. That's what the producer told me. I didn't get a single, not even the email from, from anybody, n let alone a sale. It's actually, the other thing I learned, it's not that hard to get on these shows. Because Shark Tank was so successful, there's a lot of like rip-off Shark Tank shows like this one. Um, pretty easy to get on. You just um, fill out their form, you go through a couple Skype interviews that, you know, they want to, you know, you got to have a, a, a product that's interesting, obviously. Um, but it's not that hard to get on. The only other thing I would say is that um, the episode I did, that show, there was six total teams that filmed that day. Only three got airtime. So there's also a risk that you'll go there and film and it just never gets shown. That could also happen, right? As it happened to those other three teams. So. Okay, yeah, and just to kind of show the point, these were some of the other um, projects around that show also on Indiegogo, but not much success in terms of funding, unfortunately. All right, here was mine. So this $6,000, by the way, that was all generated from my network. I got zero dollars generated from Indiegogo or the show. Was, that was all my mailing list. Okay, so I got about 10 minutes or five minutes. So let me take you through a real life um, pitch deck. If you ever find yourself in front of an investor, VC, or angel, this is typically what you need to have. Okay, and, and it's generally about 10 slides that I'm going I'm to take you through. Okay, so the first slide is very crisp. What is it that you actually do? Now, in this particular pitch that I did, our focus changed to a wearable display platform for fashion accessories. So again, I'm, I'm licensing it to existing companies, make it very clear that we're a B2B company, we license our platform to existing brands. And I added that because the first investor I pitched this to, I got all the way to the end of the deck and he still thought I was selling handbags. He didn't get that I was licensing the technology, right? And I was like, okay. Um, I didn't, but I didn't make it clear. And again, investors have a very short attention span and very little patience. So you have to be very crisp. Okay, then they want some sort of demo. I'm gonna skip that since I already showed that to you guys. Then they wanna know about the team. That's actually very important. So, you know, what have you done before? What startups have you founded prior to this? What did they do? In my case, this is my first startup, so I didn't really have the best story there. But they want some background on the actual team and, and what have you done? Because at the end of the day, you know, it's about execution. You can have this great idea, but if, if the right team isn't there, People aren't going to want to invest. Okay, and then they want to know about your business model. How are you going to make money? So here we took them through the different segments and, and the market size. So one opportunity is to license the technology to existing brands. You know, we think that's a $60 million market. Another opportunity is to white label, which basically means that someone else puts their logo on it um, and they manufacture using our design. Uh, then there's also a business model for the actual designs themselves for the content is it in app purchase and then you know this was not validated which I made it clear potentially wearable ads 
Facebook and Google, but I haven't had any discussions with them, so I couldn't claim that, so I, I just put not validated. So then they're going to want to know, you know, is there really a market for this? You have to show evidence. That's very important. Back to the customer validation. So here I took them through the story of how we interviewed. Same thing I told you guys earlier. We interviewed 100 people, feedback from the millennials, discover the interest from this demographic. Um, this is actually one of our real life customers. She's really big in the fashion world, by the way. She's a um, fashion editor, former editor for um, Vogue. So validation, validation points. Then they're going to want to know your revenue projection. And, and again, it's back to that 10x investment. So typically, if you're asking for $100,000, they're going to want to see that you're giving them a million dollars in return, as an example. OK, and then lastly, or not lastly, but competition. So to your point, who else is doing stuff like this today? Um, in our example, there are a few folks focused on the use case you mentioned with the, the biking. Um, the different differentiator with us is they're just kind of like one LED lit up. They can't do these kind of complex patterns like that, right? That's really our differentiator and, and claim to fame. Okay, and then what are you asking for? Okay, so specifically, we're asking for $300,000. What are you going to use the money for? for optimizing our design for manufacturability to get my cost down, all right? That's, that's a big problem for us right now. And what are you offering in return? You know, 15% equity. So, and typically with investors, you know, it's not like they just give you this big lump, everything you need right away. They typically want to see it in terms of milestones. They'll say, okay, I'll give you a little bit of money, go off and do what you said you can do in phase one, and then once you've proven that, come back to me in phase two and I'll give you more money. That's typically how it works. So you, you hear these things like seed rounds, round A, round B. That's, that's essentially what that means. And then lastly, they want to know your exit strategy. So what's the end game, right? So you're, you're taking my money. Are you going to be acquired by someone else? Are you going to do an IPO? How do I get my money back as an investor? So that's very important to articulate that also in your deck. And that is it. So in summary, um, you know, after all everything I told you, at the end of the day, I invested 150,000 of my own personal cash. I made 110, so I lost $40,000, right? So I could have, if I'd spent all that time mowing lawns, I would have made a lot more money, obviously. But um, but let me just ask you the question, right? Based on the story I told you, would you say success or failure? at that point. No. It's, not a, yeah, it's not a direct mm -hmm. you know, indicator of how you're going to perform in the future. Yeah. No, that, that's, that's, so I wish my wife would give that answer. My <laughs> wife is an absolute failure. <laughs> She's all about the money. But no, that's exactly the right way to think about it, right? And, and you know, the, the odds are, as a first-time entrepreneur, the odds are stacked against you. There's a good chance that your first endeavor will financially fail. But to your point, you will learn a heck of a lot. And for me personally, um, you know, it's made me better at my normal job, actually, right? I'm a much better at my, my day job because I've got these better business skills that I learned through this experience. It's kind of like a real life MBA, what you're doing today. And um, this, whole inter this whole discipline around customer interviews, again, I, you know, I don't claim to be good at marketing, but I'm way better than I was before. I was really shitty at marketing before this. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's... Now you have experience with manufacturers. Yes. 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 And a lot of connections, you know. So I know manufacturers. I know people in the fashion world. These are all good things to have in your personal network that you get by going through something like this. And then lastly, I'll say, you know, and this is where I'm a little envious of you guys. Do this while you're young. You know, I'm old. I'm, I'm 46. Michael's even older than me. So uh, we, we're, you know, it's okay. We're good friends. Um, but, you know, you guys are young. Do, do this while you're young. You know, when, when you get older like me and you, and you have a wife and kids, you know, you can't take as much risk. So you have other constraints. I have to pay for my kids' college, right? So I can't go do the iPhone case idea. I think that's a really good idea, by the way, and a lot of people have said that, because um, it's risky and I, just, I don't have the time. 
I got to worry about my kids and paying for their college and things like that. So now is the great time for you guys to go. Like I said, I'm very envious of you because you have your youth. It's the right time to do something like this. So anyway, I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah.